Ron Reagan is here. I think you all know who Ron Reagan is. Um, you've probably seen him on TV, you've probably heard him on the radio. Ron Reagan has hosted radio and TV programs going way back since his parents were in the White House. From the BBC to E! Entertainment TV to Good Morning America, MSNBC, Ron has won critical acclaim for his broadcasting. He's an active member of Hollywood's Creative Coalition and a strong defender of the rights provided for under the First Amendment. After leaving the Joffrey Ballet in 1983, he's worked as a broadcast and print journalist and TV and radio host commentator. He's co-hosted Connected Coast to Coast with Ron Reagan and Monica Crowley on MSNBC. He was a special correspondent for ABC's 2020 and Good Morning America and Fox News front page. He's worked for Animal Planet. We're all animals, aren't we? And American movie classics. He's contributed to Newsweek, The New Yorker, The LA Times, Esquire, and Interview. The Ron Reagan Show was syndicated by Air America Media. At the age of 12, Ron Reagan told his parents he would no longer go to church with them because he was an atheist. During his famous speech about stem cell research at the Democratic National Convention in 2004, Ron Reagan voiced his opinion on church-state separation, saying, it does not follow that the theology of a few should be allowed to forestall the health and well-being of the many. The New York Times in 2004 asked Ron in an interview that ran three weeks after his father died if he would like to be president. Ron said, I would be unelectable I'm an atheist, and we all know that is something people won't accept. Ron agreed to record a radio commercial for FFRF when he was hosting a show syndicated on Air America. And last year, as many of you know, and many of you have seen this, he even recorded a short 30-second TV spot to play on 60 Minutes and other news shows. But to our shock, this very sweet, very rational, very benign, slightly irreverent commercial has been banned. Not only by national CBS, ABC, and NBC, but just last month by Science Discovery. <laughs> but it has run this year in many places. It ran, uh, many of you may have seen it, it ran during the Daily Show on the penultimate show with Jon Stewart that ad ran there just before the moment of Zen. Uh, and it's been running periodically on CNN and recently on the Anderson Cooper Show for the past four weeks. And many, many individuals are responding. In fact, some woman came up to Ron today and said, you're the reason I joined the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I saw your ad. <laughs> so would you like to see that ad that has been banned? the sound up. <laughs> you got it now? There's sound coming out? Uh-oh, what happened? They'll figure it out. We had sound on the last one. Somebody knows what they're doing? Okay. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. 
Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Hmm. So for our, for our group, having somebody of his celebrity status and fame do an ad like that for the Freedom from Religion Foundation has just been an unparalleled secular blessing, if I can use that word. So we thought it would be appropriate to give Ron, before he talks tonight, two tokens of our appreciation. The first one, a t-shirt. Come on up here, Ron. Here. Unabashed atheist, unafraid of burning in hell. And a plaque, Ron Reagan 2015 Freedom from Religion Foundation, not afraid of burning in hell, unabashed atheist for you all. Thank you very much. Just before we get started here, a few concessions to encroaching age. This is one, a little water here, right, just in case. And the other, <laughs> these. You'd think that the uh, all-powerful creator of the universe, by the way, who apparently created this universe just for us, could have done something about eyesight. Don't you think human eyeballs could have been a little better? We wouldn't have a blind spot. They'd last more than 40 years without spiraling into, into blindness there. Now, they, they say that you're supposed to uh, start off any public speaking with a, with a joke, uh, you know, just to kind of loosen things up a little bit and uh, start things off in the right way. Unfortunately, I have a terrible memory for jokes. I, uh, jokes and names I just am, am bad at. My entire repertoire of jokes is two. I know two jokes. One of them involves pigs in sunglasses driving to the beach. This probably has nothing to do with what we're about here. Fortunately, the other joke is a Jesus joke. <laughs> so if, you, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll trot out my Jesus joke for you. Jesus is, we're at Calvary now, Jesus is on the cross. The usual posse is down below. There are the two Marys, the Virgin Mother, the other one. <laughs> Peter is there. He's not into denying Christ at that moment. He's there, he's under the cross. Suddenly, Peter, Peter. Yeah, yeah, yes, Lord. Yes, what is it, Lord? I, 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 I could, all right, again, please, Lord. Peter, Peter, yes, Lord, yeah. Oh, God, let me get a ladder. He goes, he gets a ladder, he brings the ladder, he throws the ladder up against the cross, he up the cross, he goes, Peter, Peter, yes, yes, Lord, yes, I'm here, my Lord. What sayest thou? Peter, I can see your house from here. <laughs> That's half of my comedic repertoire right there. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank everybody, Dan and, and Annie Laurie and, and all of you for having me here. Um, everybody at the Freedom From Religion Foundation who all been wonderful and setting all of this up. I also want to thank our previous speakers, Jeremiah and Taslima. Um, I think we should also be thankful, particularly in light of Taslima's remarks, that we live in a society where we can have a meeting like this. Not a perfect society, there are plenty of things wrong, plenty of issues we're aware of. But we're not really in dire threat here. We're not really worried that people are going to storm the hall here and gun everybody down or set us all on fire, and that's worth, uh, worth acknowledging. In other parts of the world, 
things are very different. As Lima mentioned a few atrocities, the, the Hindu men who invaded the Muslim man's home, they beat his son nearly to death, his wife managed to escape, he was dragged out into the street and beaten to death because someone alleged he had eaten beef. In Afghanistan, a 17-year-old girl is beaten nearly to death by a gang of men, then burned alive, and her body dumped in a river while her family presumably watches in this village and maybe even participated. Why? Somebody alleged that she had defiled a Koran. Now, this sort of thing doesn't happen often here, but don't make the mistake of thinking that it never could. These are human impulses and we are human beings. Doesn't matter that we live in America, these sorts of things exist on a continuum and they could indeed happen here. Now, there's something a little ironic about the, the unabashed atheist thing, I, I guess. I'm not abashed to be an atheist at all. I am abashed, I have to say, to be here. I've said this before when I, I spoke to you a few years ago, and you were so good to give me the Emperor Has No Clothes Awards. Um, I am particularly abashed being here with somebody like Taslima, who frankly leaves me in a state of awe. Pretty easy for us. We've, we've suffered some, perhaps, for our atheism, but not to that extent. We do not have a fatwa against us, most of us. I am also abashed, frankly, though, just to be here with you. Because I know that some of you really struggled with your atheism. I know that some of you were raised in very religious households and uh, and that this was difficult for you. There were dark nights of the soul. You really had to struggle to come to this conclusion that you did. And frankly, it was easy for me. As Dan said, by age 12, I told my parents, I'm not going to church anymore. I don't believe this stuff. Now, I, I guess you could say I grew up in a religious household, but we weren't that religious, you know? I mean, there was no, we didn't pray before dinner. We were Presbyterian, that's sort of Christianity light, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty easy for me to do this. There was really no struggle. And I guess it's worth considering why that might be. And maybe it was Jeremiah that mentioned the Bible and how unbelievable it was to him as a, as a small child. And, and this, I think, is the experience of a lot of kids, and I'm sure probably a few people in this hall too. You know, you're raised in a Christian household and you hear the Bible stories when you're a little, little kid. At the beginning, you usually start with Adam and Eve because that's the beginning, right? Adam and Eve, and it's a good story for little kids. You know, here are these two rather attractive people. They're naked, which is a little thrilling for a kid. They're white, which is a little strange, frankly. Apparently, the Garden of Eden is in Sweden. <laughs> One of them's made out of mud. The other is made out of his rib. But you're a little kid. You're very literal-minded. You believe what adults tell you. But it seems a little hinky. The whole thing right away. Now, I was a little strange as a kid, too, because at a very early age, I became interested in, in prehistoric humans, what I thought of at age five as cavemen. But I was aware that they ex had existed. I'd seen that little thing where the people get taller and straighter and they, finally they're us, you know. <laughs> and I was aware that there were these prehistoric. So where did Adam and Eve fit into all of that? And then the story continues. And apparently trouble's brewing in Eden because Eve gets Adam to, to eat from the tree of knowledge. Well now, to a little kid, even, Knowledge sounds like a pretty good thing. And it's a little confusing as to why God is so upset that his creations would gain knowledge. <laughs> so out of the Garden of Eden they go and apparently they start a family because now they know they're naked. You can tell because they're wearing fig leaves. 
And everybody on Earth is alleged to have arisen from these two people, which does raise the issue of incest. <laughs> and just where did we all come from if there were only two people to begin with? So you're, you're wondering about that. Right away, the, the well is poisoned for you. Something's not right here. I'm, there's, these stories are not quite right. They move on, Noah's Ark then. Another good story for kids. There's a boat, you get on it with your family, you go out to sea, animals come, two by two. It's like a carnival cruise with stuffed toys, <laughs> you know? But you get a little older and you start wondering, where the hell are the dinosaurs? How come there's no T-Rex on that boat, huh? And then you start thinking about the rest of it. First of all, how did the animals choose which two were gonna go on the boat? <laughs> God chose Noah and his families, but the animals presumably were on their own. How did they pick? You know, you're, you're, okay, you're gonna represent the elephants. Go ahead, just you two. Yeah, no, we're staying behind. And why did God have to drown all the animals? You know, I mean, he had a beef with humans. So he killed almost all of them. But did the animals have to go too? I mean, come on here. The whole thing just seems pretty damned unreasonable. And that's not even getting to the good stuff. Eventually, you get to Abraham and Isaac. Now, to a little kid, Abraham is not the hero of that story. Little kids identify with Isaac. They identify with a little kid who's trussed up on that rock, waiting for dad to plunge a dagger into him. And that doesn't seem too cool to a little kid. Abraham, definitely not the hero there. And you start looking at your own father a little strangely, too. You know? Hey, son, how about a barbecue tonight? No. No, why don't we just order pizza, okay? And put down the knife. Just put down the knife. So all of these things add up, and eventually the scales fall from your eyes. And once they've fallen, you can't really put them back, you know? I don't ever buy these stories that people say, well, you know, I was religious, then I became an atheist, and then I went back to religion. No, you didn't. You never became an atheist in the first place, because once you're there, you're not going back. Once you're an atheist, everything that somebody religious says sounds like the mountain god made us do it. <laughs> you know, it's all just a little ridiculous. Now, a word about the commercial, which we, <laughs> which we did get to see with sound. Um, as Dan mentioned, not easy getting this thing on the air. Networks did not want this on the air. We finally did, of course, manage to... Uh, to get it on in various places, but um, I, I understand why the television networks were upset about this. They didn't want to offend their customers, basically. And God, do our religious people, they just get offended so easily. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. I had a conversation actually with my brother-in-law about this. Now, my brother-in-law likes to give me a lot of crap about stuff. So I was having dinner with him the other night. He was visiting Seattle. So, I uh, saw that commercial you did the other night. Didn't you think it was a little, you know, arrogant? <laughs> I said, arrogant? What? <laughs> why, is, why am I arrogant for doing this commercial? Saying I don't believe in hell, for instance, and yet you're not saying that the people who claim to know the entire story of the universe and to talk to God, the creator themselves, they're not arrogant. I'm arrogant just for saying, hey, do you know, I know. I'm not really there. So yeah, the religious, uh, they're very uh, arrogant. I thought, geez. They're very easily offended. Of course, in the Muslim community, as Taslima mentioned, it gets pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, you draw a cartoon and Suddenly, they're burning down your country's embassy. Uh, you write a book, you've got a fatwa against you. Um, they, they take this very seriously. They don't seem to get that they don't have a right not to be offended. 
I'm offended by lots of things. They have a right to be offended. You can be offended at anything you want. But you don't have a right in this world, it seems to me, not to be offended by somebody else's speech. What offended people the most about the commercial, which seemed basically pretty benign, frankly? It was that last line about hell. <laughs> hell is a very touchy topic, it turns out, <laughs> for the religious, and you can understand why. Hell is in the, it's, it's, a, it's the way you control people. You know, you're going to hell. You better, you better do what we say you do or you go to hell. You may do fine in this world, but oh, eternity is stretching out ahead of you and it's all gonna be hell. And the rest of us are gonna sit up there in heaven and we're gonna watch you burning in hell. A nice thought, by the way, very Christian. Now, Sam Harris actually does a very interesting thing. Some of you may have seen this. I, I, like you, I, I've watched YouTube videos of these debates and things. Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, of course, and the rest. Sam Harris will ask an audience, he'll, he'll first, first determine that, that most of, uh, of the audience is, is not Muslim, uh, that is in fact Christian, and, or probably atheist in, in his case. And then he'll say, all right, you Christians, you atheists, realize that there are perhaps a billion Muslims on earth who are sure, who are dead certain that you are going to hell. He pauses, and then the kicker. Notice how little sleep you're losing over that thought. <laughs> this is what religious folks don't realize. They're warning us about a hell. They're warning us about something we consider to be imaginary. We don't care. I, fine, tell me I'm going to hell. You might as well tell me I'm going to Oz. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Not losing sleep. It's related to the, the concept, too, that we're all atheists. All of us are atheists. We're all atheists, of course. But even the religionists, they're atheists. They're atheists about every other god except theirs. None of them believe in Zeus. Few of them believe in Vishnu. All those are Thor, none of those things. They're fine being atheists about that. We just go one god farther. <laughs> we just take it all the way. You have to admit, though, this is a little weird, gathering together. A lot of you came from other places, even other countries, uh, to, to meet here in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And we're all bound by disbelief. That's why we're here. There's a certain disadvantage to this, you have to admit. We don't have a lot of chants. We don't have soaring cathedrals. We don't have special outfits that we wear. You know, it, it's, it, it is, and people like these things. People like ritual, and we don't really have, have rituals. It's, it's, it's true, we just, we just don't believe in the supernatural. Yes, we do have faith, if you'll pardon the expression, in, in things like uh, reason and facts scientific inquiry, the truth and the pursuit of it, yes, true, but still, we're atheists. We're, we're all about not believing in something. And let's face it, there's no such thing as a round earth society. There's no, nobody gets together in, in a big convention hall and talks about how, thank God, we know Santa Claus isn't real. <laughs> now, there's a reason for this, of course, and that is that we're we're a minority. Maybe 5% of the country, I suppose, might be atheists. 20% are nuns, we know from recent, uh, recent polling. But, uh, and a lot of people, I suspect, are, also, are, are, are what I would consider to be, not atheist, but apatheist. You know, there are people, yeah, they'll fill out whatever on the, on the questionnaire, that, what your religion is, but really, you know, they don't run their lives that way. They may even go to church on Sundays, but it's just more of a, a dutiful kind of thing. Yet, still, they're there. And we are a, a minority, still. And billions of people, millions of people here in the United States think we're going to hell. They think we worship Satan, which is a little ironic, since we don't believe in him either. <laughs> But that's what they think. It's, it's a little like living in a Twilight Zone episode. You know, you walk around and you're looking at people and you're thinking, boy, if they knew what I didn't believe, they 
might have thoughts about me. So now, given, given all of this, the question is, how do we behave in this twilight zone world in which we find ourselves, where many people believe in something that we consider to be imaginary, not real, and yet here we are with them. And they think that we're, just like my brother-in-law, who, by the way, is an atheist too, but he, he works with a lot of fundamentalist Christians, so they gave him a whole raft of stuff about my commercial, of course, and he was bringing that to me. But, um, but these people all think we're strident. You know, the word strident always seems to precede atheist. You know, a strident atheist, an aggressive atheist, mean-spirited atheist. Why do they have to bring that up anyway? Well, it's because religionists, they love playing the victim these days. It used to be they were on top. Now, they're, you know, the foundation is crumbling a little bit, and they love playing the victim card. Any critique of religion is regarded as an insult. Well, I, you know, I'm sorry, but <laughs> people have their opinions. The, the absurdity, you think of Richard Dawkins, of course, the famed biologist and, and atheist, he's accused of being strident when he invokes facts in support of critical thinking. Kim Davis, the <laughs> Kentucky clerk, she's fitted out for the robes of martyrdom when she invokes God in defense of bigotry. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it's all about insecurity. Religious people, you can tell, are terribly, terribly insecure. They know that they're holding a weak hand. And I, as I said, some of you probably watch the debates on YouTube, you know, Sam Harris and, and, and the rest. And boy, you can see it's a lot of the religionists just folding like a cheap suit. You know, all of a sudden it's, you know, God, well, God is, you know, he's just a buddy. It's just kind of an amorphous blob. All of a sudden, they're, they're abandoning their own holy books, you know, in the face of reason. Because they know they're holding this weak hand. And then they resort to the absurd, of course. Fox News, they're gearing up for the war on Christmas. It's coming. You know, the big with the war on Christmas that we're always trying to, to foment there, that we're always trying to... I'm an atheist. I love Christmas. You know, I cut down a tree every year. I put presents underneath it and all of that. It's a pagan holiday. Why not? You know. But, uh, but they, they, love that, uh, they love that kind of stuff. The war on Christmas. You couldn't, it, it, what is it, early October, within two weeks, you won't be able to swing a dead elf without knocking over a Christmas tree. <laughs> you know, the war on Christmas. Because it's the most ubiquitous holiday on earth. The war on Christmas. Come on. But religionists fear knowledge. You remember Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge. They don't like knowledge so much. They don't like scientific inquiry very much or at all. They don't, they don't like that kind of thing. And I think the fear is, the realization is really, that science has supplanted religion as our source of wonder. Used to be it was the cathedral, used to be it was the sermon, used to be it was the, the holy book and the, just the stories and all of that, and that was enough for us. Now we've got the Hubble telescope. Now we can look out into the universe and we understand how vast this universe is and how faintly ridiculous it seems to believe that an ostensible creator deity made the whole thing just for us. Why did he wait so long to bring us onto the scene? That's what I wanted, 13.8 billion years old, and we only arrived, you know, day before yesterday. Well, it's, God had a plan, I guess. <laughs> That's what they say. God had a plan. All sorts of science, though, they're, they're just recently. They discovered that tool use by human beings 
way farther, way back, farther back than we thought. It, in fact, predates our own genus, Homo. It looks now like Australopithecines, those little creatures that looked a little like chimpanzees. They were making tools, too. Ooh, so it wasn't just us, huh? Mars. They found water on Mars. Where there's water, there may be life. There may have been life on Mars. There may still be life on Mars. And what's more, the life that was on Mars, since Mars formed before Earth did, may have actually seeded life on Earth. Genesis needs a rewrite. <laughs> if we're all Martians, that kind of throws that whole story right into the crapper, doesn't it? The whole thing, in fact, all of this makes Genesis and the Bible story seem rather tacky and small. You know, the two people, the tree, the talking snake. Yeah. Now, go, I'm going with the Hubble telescope. I'm going with Stephen Hawking. I'm going with Mars. I'm going with all of that stuff. Now, so, what do we do? What do we do here, trapped in this? strange twilight zone world with a bunch of people who are perhaps delusional. Well, I think we know, you know we, we talk a lot about the public sphere, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, but then there's the private sphere also. How do we just act with people? I'm sure we've all been, oh, I don't know, cocktail parties or whatever in a small group when somebody suddenly out of nowhere decides to inform you that that hurricane that hit the coast the other day yeah, was God's punishment for our being nice to gay people. <laughs> what do you do? You know, I mean, in that situation, do you speak up? Do you, do you shut up? Well, I say you speak up. I say you do. Now, you don't have to do this all the time. Somebody says, God bless you, and you sneeze. That's not your invitation to jump all over them. <laughs> but there are lines that, uh, that are, are, get crossed, and I, I think at that point you, you're obligated to, uh, to speak up. Now, we should say, too, that religious belief is, is understandable from an evolutionary standpoint. So we don't have to get angry at these people, necessarily. Uh, we know, for instance, and, and Jeremiah alluded to this in, in his remarks, that uh, human beings evolved on the African savanna, and we are genetically programmed to see agency in everything. As he said, you're walking along in the savanna and the grass rustles near you. You can go two ways with that. Eh, it's just a breeze, or ooh, might be a lion. Now, if you go, whoop, might be a lion, you're more likely to survive and pass on these might be a lion genes to your offspring. And over generations, generation after generation, human beings have been programmed to see agency in things. That's, you know, the wind blows because of the wind god. The sea is foaming because of the, the, the ocean god. We, we, we think in these, in these terms. And, uh, and the other thing, is that early on, religious belief, shared religious belief within a community, was probably good for that community. It gave you cohesion. And the next group over, maybe they didn't believe in anything. They didn't have as, as much cohesion in their group, which meant that you could go over there and take all their stuff. And again, you then got to propagate more, and uh, religion seemed like a good idea. Um, the question arises, though, when we're talking about individuals, not people in positions of power, should we care what they believe? Should we bother to talk to them about atheism? Yes. Yes, I think we should. Given the opportunity, given the right circumstances, yes. In democracy, in a democracy, it's all about people, and people have to make reasonable choices in a democracy. And faith, blind faith, is the abdication of reason. You can't have a functioning democracy when most of the people in your community believe in a lot of nonsense. 
and are training their minds to accept nonsense, accept things for which there is no evidence. If you want good public policy, it has to be based on facts. It has to be based on evidence. It has to be based on what is real, not just what you would like to think is real. Private beliefs invade public policy. All the politicians you see invoking God, they were just private citizens once, and now they're in Congress. It's also, it seems to me, a very important and interesting conversation to have with people. Again, we don't have to be overly aggressive about it, but this is about the nature of reality. This is about where we fit in in the universe, and I can't think of too many things, too many topics that are more interesting than that. So absolutely, absolutely, we should, uh, we should confront people. Now, this has to be done with sen sensitivity. Again, you don't, somebody says, God bless you when you sneeze. You don't, you know, go nuts on them. People who are religious are not necessarily stupid, and they're not necessarily crazy. Some of them may be. Are they delusional? Well, the fervently religious are certainly in the grip of a delusion, but again, this is understandable to a degree. A word about death. We accept that most religions are predicated on the fear of death, and this is certainly true. The, the idea of an afterlife can be a very powerful thing for people. Um, I think it again was Sam Harris who reminded people once in one of his talks, he said, remember when you're talking to just folks about this sort of thing, consider that you may be talking to a mother who has just lost a child. You want to be very careful how you approach somebody and don't make it seem as if you're saying your sincere wish to be reunited with that child at some time and place in the afterlife is ridiculous. You're never going to see that child again, and the whole thing is just a big joke. I know from personal experience that when you lose somebody close to you, you very much want to think that you can be reunited with that person. And this is a, a natural human urge, and I think we have to keep it in mind when we do talk to people, individuals, um, who are religious. Just bear in mind that there are sensitive aspects to this. However, it is not cruel to apply the same standards of discourse to religion as we do to politics, our aesthetic judgments, our taste in music or film. We argue sometimes viciously about those sorts of things. But religion somehow is treated as different, sacrosanct, if you will. We're not allowed, and you rarely see it in media at all, where somebody will express a religiously inspired opinion that may be just complete balderdash. But as long as it's dressed up in the, in the trappings of religion, people get a pass. This is not right. People deserve respect. Beliefs do not necessarily deserve respect. Somebody comes and tells you that the earth is flat, you do not have to respect that belief. We know differently. Somebody comes and tells you that they speak to God and know what he wants. You don't have to respect that belief. You can confront that. Respect the person, but there is no, no obligation to respect somebody's belief. When you deal with people who are religious, 
you discover, and I'm sure you know this, that they'll try and turn the tables on you. They will often make it seem like the burden of proof is on you. And you'll get the sort of, well, then how did the universe begin? <laughs> well, I don't know, and neither do they. The difference is, I'm comfortable saying, I don't know, and we'll look into it, and we'll try and figure it out. We don't have the burden of proof. It's the people who claim to know the whole story and to talk to God, they've got the burden of proof. And this is a little difficult for them at times. Uh, the advantage of disbelief is that, is we don't make an affirmative case here. We speak up for free speech and free thought and all of that, but we're not making grand claims about the universe. We just don't believe their story. That's all. Who is arrogant again here? I mean, there's no arrogance here. We just, we, I, I don't know. And I'm comfortable with I don't know. It's the people who make up the stories, it seems to me, that are, are the arrogant ones. I find that asking people, the religious people, questions is a good idea. Instead of just diving right in with, you know, this, this is why I don't believe in your God, this is why I think it's ridiculous and all of that sort of thing, ask them a question. They say, that, well, you know, God made the universe. And, Wait a minute, what is God? This turns out to be some, something of a stumper for the religious. <laughs> Most of them really can't explain to you what they mean when they invoke God. You know, this is, they order their entire lives around this deity that is just this vague thing, even to them. Oh, they'll say, well, God is love. God is the creator. Well, this is redundant. You can't say, well, God created the universe. What is God? Well, he's the one that created the universe. This is just a tautology. This is, you know, the kind of circular reasoning you get. Then, of course, there's the, the problem that no religionist can really handle, and that is... And you know this. If God is good and all-loving and all-knowing and all-powerful, how does he tolerate the suffering of the innocent, particularly small children? Either God sees this happening and can't do anything about it, or sees this happening and just doesn't really care to do anything about it. Which is it? They don't know. It's just a big mystery to them. Of course, they, they have questions for us as well, which I rather enjoy. <laughs> One of my favorites involves art. Well, without religion, where would we, where would we get all the great art of the Renaissance? the great cathedrals and the Sistine Chapel and all of that. If it wasn't for religion, we wouldn't have any of that stuff, right? Well, it's true that religion financed a lot of that kind of stuff, but I can tell you with dead certainty that the people who actually built the Duomo in Florence and Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, they didn't do that in a state of religious fervor. In order to build those, those buildings and, and create those artworks, they needed reason and intellect. And that is how those works were created. Financed by religion, yeah, they were the only game in town at that point. You might also, if you, if you really want to get a little deeper into it too, and impress them with your knowledge of, of Renaissance art, you might talk about Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck was a Dutch painter. He began about 20 or 30 years before Leonardo was even born. Jan van Eyck was painting photorealistic portraits of not religious figures, just folks in his town, people who could pay to have their portrait done. He was probably using a camera obscura to do that. Again, this is long before the Italian Renaissance, long before the great cathedrals and all that sort of thing. This is, uh, this is a guy who was a scientist, apparently. In, in fact, a scientist. He invented oil painting, and it wasn't religious inspiration. 
that allowed him to do that. The other thing that you always get is, well, how do you know good from, from evil? How do you know how to behave if you don't have the book telling you how to behave? Well, first of all, that book is not exactly a, uh, you know, infallible reference for, you know, behavior in this, this world. There's an awful lot of fratricide and infanticide and all sorts of bad lessons in, in, in the Bible. I'm not an authority on, on religion any more than I'm authority on atheism, actually. But, and I, don't, I haven't read the Koran, but uh, I know enough of my Bible to, uh, to know that there's just some terrible, terrible, Abraham and Isaac is, is one of them. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What is that about? <laughs> Again, this is a hero who's, what kind of a hero is this? The angels show up in Gomorrah. The townspeople, as they would, gather around Lot's house wanting to rape the angels because <laughs> You would, you know. And Lot, being the good host that he is, isn't going to let that happen. So what does he do? It's not, leave the angels alone. Okay? Take my daughters instead and do whatever you want with them. Because really, they're just women. It doesn't matter. What kind of a lesson is this? The other one, so, so knowing, knowing good from bad. How do we know good from bad? Well, the answer to that is easy. The same way you do, religionist, it's inherent to us. Little children understand automatically, intrinsically, the golden rule, that you treat other people like you want to be treated and, and that sort of thing. All little kids get this. You don't even have to teach that. You have to encourage it, but they know it. Not only do they know it, but animals know it too. One thing religion loves to do is take us and put us in a separate category because we have to have dominion over all the other things there and so they can't be our equal in any way. We're the special God's creation. He made us in his image. The animals, it's somebody else's image, I guess. We're just a product of his active imagination. But animals, it turns out, have these sort of senses too. Baboons, for instance, because this can cut both ways. You know, if you can do good, you can also do bad. You know, if you can be honest, you can also cheat. The, the concept is, is it's a whole there. You can't have one without the other. Baboons, when they find some food out there on the savanna, have been observed. They find the little food, and nobody else sees it. But if they start eating, everybody else is going to notice, hey, Bob's got some food. Let's, over they go. So what do they do? They make the call for a predator, sends all the other baboons scattering into the trees, and they can eat their meal alone. <laughs> they cheat. On the flip side, recent uh, story, you may have seen it, uh, elephants. There is an elephant sanctuary. There are actually several in, in Africa, but this particular elephant sanctuary, this is where uh, hunting is not allowed, poachers are kept out, there's uh, medical facilities, they can actually treat uh, elephants there who are injured or sick or, or, or whatever. So recently, a couple of male elephants show up at the sanctuary and they've been shot with poison arrows and poachers. But they present themselves at the sanctuary and the sanctuary and fix them up. Well, how did they know about this? They'd never been, these two elephants, to this sanctuary before. Ah, but they had mated with a couple of elephants who had. Now think about this for a second. Those elephants shot with poison arrows by some humans have been told, we can only surmise, by these other elephants that those people over there are good. Those people over there will help you if you're in trouble. Think about that. Not only is that some very complex information to be transmitted elephant to elephant, but it has to include the concept of empathy, or at least sympathy. Think about the ramifications of that. 
We all know elephants are smart, but this suggests that they have a sense of empathy and good and bad, right and wrong. These people bad, those people good, and we can distinguish between the two. So I don't hear any stories about God making elephants in his image, but maybe they should do another rewrite there in the Bible. Um, on to the public, and we might as well start with Kim Davis. I'm not going to go into a whole, you guys know more about, uh, uh, about the, the, the fight against uh, the incursion of, of religion into, into public life than I do, I'm sure, than I'll ever know. But there are a few little things we can, we can talk about, point out things that are, that are topical. Kim Davis, the uh, poster child for bigotry, the October centerfold of Bigot Magazine. <laughs> As you know, she, uh, after the Supreme Court ruled that gay people had a right to get married just like everybody else does, Kim Davis objected to this. She didn't like that at all. So as her, uh, in her position as county clerk in Kentucky, she decided that not only wasn't she going to issue marriage licenses for gay couples, she wasn't going to issue marriage licenses at all. And not only wasn't she going to do it, she wasn't going to let anybody in her office do it either. And when asked about this, she invoked famously, infamously, God's authority. Kim Davis apparently has the hotline to God. And God was giving her this strategy about, okay, you can't just refuse the gay people, you've got to refuse all the people, and watch the people in your office, they're going to want to hand out these things, don't let them do that too. All this sort of thing. It's, it's religious bullying is what it amounts to. Now, people have tried to make her out to be the equivalent of conscientious objectors during wartime. These are people who, following their conscience, uh, will not kill, will not fight, and kill other human beings. But in order for this analogy to really make any sense, you have to think about what, what does a conscientious objector in wartime do? Well, one of two things. Either they simply refuse to participate at all. I won't join your army. Or I'll join your army, but I'm not going to actually do the killing. But I will support the effort by becoming a medic and supporting the troops in that way. If Kim Davis were actually a conscientious, conscientious objector, there would be a couple of obvious courses of action for her to take. The first one, probably the best advised one, quit. <laughs> you were elected to do a certain job, and now you discover you can't in good conscience do that job anymore. Fine. Resign. It's easy. You just walk out the door and say, I'm done, in accordance with your conscience. The other thing you could do is say, OK, I'm uncomfortable actually handing over the license, signing the thing and all, that's all right. The law allows her associate clerks to do that themselves. So you simply let them do it. But no, no, Kim couldn't, couldn't go with that. And, you know, it became ridiculous. The fact that her name is on the, you know, the, the heading of the, the piece of paper that's the license, that becomes a big problem. You know, again, these people become so neurasthenic with their, I mean, you really just bring out the fainting couch for Kim because, oh my God, my name is on this piece of paper and that's such an affront to my religious sensibilities that gay people could get married too. No one else's conscience, by the way, counts for Kim. What about the conscience of, of the associates in her, in her office there? At least one of whom, in fact, all of whom except her son, were perfectly willing to give these licenses to people. But oh, no, 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 Kim's got it straight from God that they shouldn't be allowed to do this. <laughs> you know, a lot of conservatives didn't go along with this. They were bright enough to see where this would inevitably lead. And I'm sure that you've thought of it now, too. And I'm, I'm sure you thought of it right away. If the Kim Davises of the world can cite their Christian consciences 
as a way to get out of doing their official duties and you know, as part of the government, well, what about a Muslim? How would Kim Davis feel if a Muslim county clerk, the next county over, decided that, well, you know, we're not practicing Sharia law here, so I just can't go along with any of this. We have to practice Sharia law. Would she be okay with that? I think not. No, I think not. I don't think uh, Kim Davis is really into religious freedom as such. She just wants to be free herself to practice the kind of bigotry that she sees enshrined in the Bible. A lot of, uh, a lot of constitutional conservatives get on the, uh, the side of people like Kim Davis, constitutional conservatives. These are people who think that the only worthwhile thing in the Constitution is the Second Amendment. <laughs> Apparently the entire Constitution was created just so we could carry sidearms into bars and kindergarten classes. <laughs> that was the whole thing. And the Supreme Court joined in this, this sort of illiterate reading of this. I know I'm digressing here, and this isn't directly related to us, but I just can't help it. The Supreme Court, this Supreme Court, joined in this illiterate reading of the Second Amendment. What do they think the Second Amendment says? What about that part about a well-regulated militia being necessary for the preservation of free state? What did that mean, comma? It's all one sentence. The whole thing is just one sentence. What does that first phrase mean to them? Well, we know what it means because we study history. They don't. We do. We know what the discussion was in the Continental Congress and it had nothing to do with an individual right to carry. And in fact, the Supreme Court for 200 years agreed that this was a discussion about state militias. You notice the Second Amendment does not say, I know I'm going on a little more than I thought I would here, but I'm just gonna get worked up about this. <laughs> the Second Amendment doesn't say a person's right to keep and bear arms. They said the people's right to keep and bear arms. That meant the states. The states can keep an armory and they can have a militia and that's what we'll do. We won't have a standing army because we see that as on the road to tyranny. So yes, states can have a militia. That's the Second Amendment. And everybody knew it, everybody in the Supreme Court at least, for 200 years until this court decided some years ago that uh, they were going to reinterpret it. Um, Planned Parenthood. Remember that religion trains your mind to accept the reality of things that aren't real. To accept assertions based on no evidence whatsoever or false evidence. Demonstrably false evidence. The Planned Parenthood hearings in Congress, you might have seen some of them. It became very obvious that this wasn't about Planned Parenthood selling fetal body parts wasn't about money, federal money, going to Planned Parenthood. It was all just about abortion. And the anti-choice movement is predominantly religiously inspired. I was arguing with somebody on the radio the other day, conservative, I do this radio show where you, know, you argue with a conservative. And at some point he announced that you know, Planned Parenthood, they're in the business of killing babies. Oh, come on, you know, nobody, you know, and I reminded him that, you know, it's possible to have qualms about abortion without thinking that you have to deceive people in order to make your argument. And it is so frustrating that people in the media, people in politics, act as if these videotapes that came out actually demonstrate that Planned Parenthood was doing something illegal. They do not. They were deceptively edited, altered in all sorts of ways, more ways than you, you think of. There was a technical study done of some of these videotapes and they were, you know, really, really doctored, these things. And why is that not the story? Why is the story Planned Parenthood and not the fact that these people had an agenda and thought it was perfectly okay to lie about something in order to further that agenda? And people, mostly on the right, of course, believe in this, this stuff. They don't care that the videotape is faked. They don't care that the facts say something completely different than what they're asserting. And why shouldn't they feel that way? Because they were brought up, I'm sure 90% of them at least, brought up to believe things 
that aren't true. This is what religion teaches your mind to accept. If you believe in, in, in the supernatural, you can believe in, in just about anything. Reason goes right out the window. Some of you may have seen, and you can either see this as a humorous thing or something you really just want to start throwing, you know, stuff at your, your laptop over. Ever see the, the discussion between Richard Dawkins, the biologist, and Wendy Wright, the creationist? Oh my God. First of all, Wendy Wright, the poor thing is dumb as a post. And Richard Dawkins is not. And they're arguing about human evolution. And Wendy Wright keeps saying, show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. And, Rich, and, and Dawkins, of course, keeps explaining the evidence to her. <laughs> Offers to take her down to the street to the, to the Natural History Museum and show her the actual skulls and things like that. Show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. Well, she doesn't want to see any evidence. She's not interested in evidence. What an annoying person she was. I had to say, I had to hand it to Richard Dawkins for being able to, to put up with any of that. Climate change. There's another one. You know, if you want to believe stuff that's just not true. God is often invoked by the climate change deniers, particularly those in Congress. Jim Inhofe, who's in charge of the Senate committee that oversees environmental regulation has written a whole book claiming that climate change is a hoax. One of his lines of reasoning, if you want to call it that, is that, well, you know, we don't control the climate. God does. <laughs> and we can't do anything about this because God is in charge of the climate. And it leads people, again, to just make stuff up. I, was, I did Bill Maher's show a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and so I watched a few of his shows just to kind of get into the mood. And I caught his interview with Rick Santorum, <laughs> in which Rick Santorum made several noteworthy claims. Do you know, says Rick Santorum to Bill Maher, that 50 per, 57, he had this, 57 percent of climate scientists don't agree that human influence is responsible for climate change. 57% of climate scientists, says Rick Santorum. Now, Bill Maher is a comedian. He's not a trained journalist, doesn't have those sorts of chops. Thank God, if you'll pardon the expression. Because <laughs> Bill Maher's response was, what ass did you pull those figures out of, <laughs> Mr. Santorum? Now, you wouldn't see Jake Tapper or any of these other guys that are doing the debates. They would not say to a Rick Santorum on television, what ass did you pull that out of? They wouldn't say anything like that. Santorum's not done yet. Then he says, well, we all know that about 97% of climate scientists which is as near to unanimity in the scientific community as you can get on any issue. 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are, in fact, warming the climate. No, 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 says Rick Santorum. No, no. It turns out, says Rick, that that, that assertion, that study, was based on interviews with only seven climate scientists. I'm not sure how you get 97%, actually, out of seven <laughs> climate scientists. But no, it wasn't. It was, it, was, it was based on a meta-study of 30 years worth of peer-reviewed journal articles by climate scientists that indicate that 97% of them agree with this. And really, if you want to get down to it, ask somebody like Rick Santorum, given that CO2 is a heat-trapping gas, given that we've raised the level of it by 40% since the Industrial Revolution, and these are, just, these are just facts. I mean, this is easily measurable. They've done the experiments with CO2, and you do it in the lab. You know, we, we can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere. Given those two facts, how could we not be warming the planet? But I suspect that, uh, that Rick really wouldn't care because 
reality doesn't matter to people like Rick Santorum and his fellow religionists. And anyway, we're all just going to be raptured up in a few decades anyway. So what does it doesn't really matter. Well, he's going to be raptured up. We'll be stuck down here on a sweltering planet, I'm sure. Oh, I just saw something today, too, and I made a note of this. Um, Lamar Smith, who is, he's a Texas congressman. He's sort of uh, Jim Inhofe's uh, counterpart in the, in the House. Jim Inhofe, of course, in the, in the Senate. So Lamar Smith um, has uh, claimed, I just watched this, that there's been no global warming for the last 18 years. No warming, it turns out, according to... Now, in case you're wondering, he says warming stopped in 1998. That was it. No warming since then. 1998 was a very warm year. We had El Nino and the temperatures did spike. For a while, it was the warmest year on record until 2005 and then 2010, and then 2014, and now, probably, this year. In fact, 10 of the warmest years on record have taken place since 1998. So Lamar Smith, like Rick Santorum before him, and don't you bet that Lamar Smith goes to church on Sundays when he has a chance? Lamar Smith is just making stuff up. So, I started off by saying that we, we were joined in, uh, in disbelief, and we are, but it's worth mentioning that we do believe things as well, and we have certain obligations, it seems to me. Those, those beliefs oblige us to behave in a certain way in, in the world. Um, we live in a global society now. And you think about women like Taslima. There are many, many Taslimas around the world. And we are all complicit to some degree in their subjugation, their religious oppression. Now, people on the left, I have to say, will often recoil when you start identifying cultures as being repressive cultures, particularly around women. Well, it's a, it's a cultural thing. Don't be an Islamophobe. Well, it may be a cultural thing, but I don't care. You know, why are we doing business? A culture that, that doesn't allow women to dress the way they want to dress, that doesn't allow women meaningful political participation equal to that of a, of a man doesn't allow women to drive, doesn't allow women to leave their home without being accompanied by a male, all the things that Taslima was talking about, that's not a culture worth preserving. Okay, they may have beautiful paintings and things like that too, I, that's fine. They may make nice buildings, and that, that's fine, they can keep those, but the rest of that stuff, it's gotta go. And why are we doing business with countries that practice that sort of oppression? Imagine, imagine, if France, tomorrow, France and Germany decided that they would institute a dress code for women and deny them political participation and impose all these sorts of rules, imagine what the reaction would be. Imagine the calls for boycotts. Imagine the calls for international isolation of France and Germany, the shock and revulsion that we would all feel that these countries could do something like that. And yet, we continue to do business with countries who do. Saudi Arabia, for instance, notable among them. Well, this is, this is not good. We need to take this case abroad. We need to put pressure on, on countries to do the right thing, to treat their citizens humanely. I don't care about their culture, don't care about their religion either, sorry. Doesn't matter, not a culture worth preserving if that's how you express that culture. We do believe in things as atheists. We believe in truth, 
We believe in beauty. We believe in a shared humanity. These are things worth fighting for. And don't forsake the numinous and the transcendent either. We all know that there are experiences that we have in, in life that are more than just material. You listen to a piece of music, you see a sunset, whatever it might be, poetry, and you leave yourself in a way. Don't, don't let religion have a monopoly on that kind of experience. It is not specific to religions. We need to reclaim the numinous and the transcendent, as well as all these other things. And you guys are the point of the spear in that. All of us are. And we need to take it seriously, and we need to do, do right by the Taslimas of the world. If nothing else, if nothing else, we have to do right by all of the Taslimas of the world. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it very much.